How are you guys doing this afternoon? Good. Yeah? Everybody had a lunch and had enough coffee and stuff, and I'm going to go, go into a carb coma on me? You wish. <laughs> so I want to talk about a couple of things or mention a couple of things that are happening in, in Rockfish Church that before I get into the message. And you guys heard a little bit about it during the announcement videos, but um, <clears throat> the first one is the, small, the women's small group Bible study that is happening on Thursday nights. And it's, it's called Trustworthy. And it's a study in First and Second Kings, and it's really exploring the trustworthy of God, worthiness of God, and how he, he is worth our trust, even sometimes when we don't feel like it. And, and we just, we need to rely on him and trust him. And this is a guide, and this is just looking at it and kind of helping, helping us or helping you, the people who study it, to trust God on another level. Because I think that's very, very important, especially in this day and age, to trust God on deeper levels than we have been. The other thing is, we're talking this month about pursuing God. We're talking about being in pursuit of him and running after him. And so one of the things we wanted to do is <clears throat> we would love to see, and how many of you guys would love to see God do a major move in Rockfish Church? And not just in Rockfish Church, but in all the churches that preach the gospel. But how about in your individual lives? Wouldn't it be great to see God move in your individual lives? And so one of the things that we want to do and that we understand and we know is that a lot of times in, in our lives, we can do good things, a lot of good things. But if God is not a part of them, then we've missed the point. And so we've got this, this small group study that we're, we're starting, and it starts the last weekend of February, and we're gonna, they're going to be done all over the place. And if you are interested in signing up to be a part of this small group study, Good or God, you can go online right now and you can sign up. If you don't find a group that fits, I'm still getting group information in or host information in right now. Actually, you can be a part, you can still be a part of it. You can just send me, send me an email or actually online, there's a way that you could send me some your contact info so I can get a hold of you and talk to you about what groups would be a good fit for you. That being said too, host, it is really important if you signed up to be a host, especially if you weren't here Saturday, um, that I get your information and I talk to you and I'm able to hand you this. I have several, ho many hosts actually who have not told me, but I do know that we have enough hosts or people signed up to be hosts that we could host over 500 people going through this study. I think we should be able to blow that out of the water. I mean, we have 2,600 people in this church. Wouldn't it be amazing to see 1,000 of them going through it? I want, to be able, I want to have this problem, guys. I challenge you, church, Rockfish Church, and those of you watching online, if you want to, if you want to host one of these in your home, let me know. Um, I challenge you to make me order more. You understand? I challenge you to make me order more of these. Now let's see if we can live up to that challenge. Let's see if that can happen. But uh, let's pray, and we'll get into God's word today. Father, we come to you today, and we ask, one, that, that we would sense your presence, that your presence would be overwhelming in this place. Lord, and for those of the, that are watching online, that they would sense your presence right where they are. Lord, that you would speak to your people, and you would speak clearly and you would use me to speak clearly. Father, and I pray, the other thing I pray is that you would shut down everything that would dare get in the way. Lord Jesus, any distractions, any anxiety, nervousness, apprehension, doubt, that you would silence it right now in the name of Jesus so that we can hear your voice and see your face. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> when I was younger, when Rachel and I actually, we were newlyweds, and last week Rachel and I just celebrated our anniversary, and I'm not going to tell you how many anniversaries we celebrated because that might reveal to you how old I actually am, and most people can't guess my age that don't know me, um, but I worked with troubled teens in Hope County. Now, I'm, I'm one of those rare people in the area that was actually born in Cape Fear Valley Hospital. I am homegrown, guys. Anybody else in here homegrown? Yeah, we got a few. Okay, we've had a few in every service, but most people in this area, let's be honest, are transplants, especially now. I mean, I am homegrown 
to the core. Now, my parents were transparent, or transplants, you know, and I'll forgive them for that, but um, I, was grown, I grew up here, and like I said, I was serving at this time in a capacity where I was working with troubled teens, and by troubled teens, I don't just mean kids who had so, some issues. I'm talking about I had gang members, I had violent offenders, I had, um, I remember one kid, he went to Turlington, which is the alternative school here in Hoke County, and he, he turned his life around. It was amazing, but he took a TV tray cart, okay, and for those of you who don't know that are younger and you guys have smart boards and stuff, they used to have to put the big old box TVs on this cart and wheel them into the classroom. He was helping move it or do something, and he saw one of his teachers that he didn't like coming up the stairs, and he shoved this TV, TV cart down on her. And uh, so we had all kinds of stuff. Man, I had fights in there. I remember one time I had these two guys that were in my, in my class, and they, they were the only two there that day, thank God. But one of them was a crip, and the other one was a blood. And for those of you who don't know gangs, those are two arch rivals, Okay. That is, that is like putting a Ravens fan in with a, Balt I mean with a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. It's just not going to work. Okay, so these guys, here's the deal. They had fought each other. And they had fought each other because somebody else told them that they wanted to fight each other. It was crazy. So I had, the, this is the kind of classroom I had. And one of the things that I would teach them, and it would almost always blow their minds, is that Every choice you make, every decision you make, every action you perform affects other people. Every single one. And they would, they would say some crazy stuff because I would say, okay, give me something you can do that doesn't affect anybody else. I'm not going to share some of the things they said. Because like I said, they were troubled teens. And they would say some crazy stuff. But... I did kind of think about this, this this last couple of weeks, and I was like, what could I use in this example? So I got this example, and it's, it's a harmless example. So what it is, is anybody, anybody in here a fisherman? Anybody like to fish? Yeah, I got a couple. Okay, let's say you invite somebody, or if you're somebody who doesn't normally fish, you get invited to go fishing with somebody, right? And, and you don't go out in the boat, but you're standing on the shore, and you're casting, you're casting your lines and stuff, inevitably what happens, especially with people who aren't fishermen, and they're not catching a lot that day, they get bored. Anybody ever gone fishing and got bored? Yeah. You know, it's nap time, whatever. But let's say you decide, as the person who's been invited to go, you decide you're bored, you've cast your line, you know, you're waiting for your bobber, you're doing your, your lure thing, and you just kind of get bored. So you decide to do something else. So you start picking up rocks. You start tossing them in the water. Just absentmindedly toss them in the water. You're not harming anybody, right? You're not hurting anything. But I'm going to tell you something. You are definitely affecting that other fisherman. You're affecting the other person who's fishing. Why? Because you're scaring the fish. The fish are going into hiding or they're swimming away. And let me tell you something. If you keep doing that, Somebody is going to get hurt because he's going to take his fillet knife to you. Because if he's a serious fisherman, they don't play. I've been out with some serious fishermen. They don't play. You don't talk bad about their fishing skills. You don't, talk, you don't mess with their fishing time. You just, okay, you just let it happen. But you guys, the idea in our society is that if you're not harming anybody, if you, if you can't see the physical evidence or the, the emotional or mental evidence of somebody being harmed, you're okay. You're not doing anything wrong. And the deal is that God has so many things in his word that he says, tells us not to do that, that don't fit that criteria. And why does he have that? Why do you think God hates sin so much? Why do you think? This is the question and answer time. Because it affects others, right? What happens with, when sin comes into our lives or we allow sin to, to reign in our lives or we make certain decisions and, and, and concepts or we do certain things is we actually cause a severing 
of our connection with other people and with God. And God stresses unity. You read throughout the Bible. If you really look into the Bible, you'll find that God talks about unity a whole lot. Jesus prayed. His final prayer was on the unity of the church and that we would be unified. One of the reasons why Jesus got so frustrated with the Pharisees is because they were causing dissension. And so God hates disunity and he hates anything that would disrupt the unity. Now, by unity, I don't mean people being comfortable. What I mean is real unity. You know, I have, I have a very amazing wife and she will tell me like it is and it isn't always comfortable. But it increases the unity in our home. It's important to run after unity, guys. And the unity spiel, that was kind of for free. But we're going to take a look at a tragic example in Scripture of the truth that our decisions and our, the, the actions that we take affect other people. And they have consequences that are far-reaching beyond what we could think or imagine many times. We're going to look at how one man's disobedience brought about the death of another man and an overwhelming sense of fear to a company of worshipers. Now, can you imagine? Think about this with me. We're in a worship setting. Can you imagine if all of a sudden everybody in the room was just overcome with fear? That's how powerful this moment was. And it's because of this one man's sin. And this man was David. And David did something very wrong. Now, David, to me, David is the epitome of what it means to be a, be a follower of Jesus. You're either on it or you're off of it. And the, the thing with David was, he didn't just get a little bit off of it. He, man, many times he was way off of it, okay? You look at David's story, and so many times we elevate David, but he was a real guy. And he was raw. And if you really read scripture and you dig into it, you can kind of see that. So in chapter 6 of 2 Samuel, we read that David is the king of Israel. And he has a desire to bring in the Ark of the Covenant, which is the Old Testament representation of the power and the presence of God on the earth. It is the physical representation and manifestation of God's presence and power. And he wants to bring it into Jerusalem. Now think about this, what this means, and let's put it in today's perspective for a second. That would be like Donald Trump, President Trump saying, I want the power and the presence and the spirit of God in Washington, D.C. How many of us would get behind that? Y'all quiet. How many would get behind it? Yeah, okay, that's a little bit better. I don't know, I was, for a little bit, I was thinking I was going to have to bring out those hard things. Kapow! But... But that's what the equivalent is, is. David is a king who is renowned throughout all the land, not just through Israel. He is, he is considered one of the greatest kings in history. If you start reading history, you start exploring history, he's up there with Julius Caesar. He is well known. This guy is, is not, he's not a fly by the seat of the pants type of guy. He is, he is known. He is not some obscure person. But he wants to bring the power and the presence of God into Jerusalem. So we're going to look at what happens starting in verse 2. And we're going to read through verse 11. And David rose and went with all the people who were with him to Bel Judah. To bring from there the ark of God which was called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts. Who is enthroned above the cherubims. And they placed the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadad, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ohio were the sons of Abinadad, and they were leading this new cart. So they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadad, which was on the hill. And Ohio was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir woods and lyres and harps and tambourines and cassinets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out towards the ark of God and took a hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. 
David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. And the place was called Perez Uzzah to this day. So David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come with me? And David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Jeite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Jeite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. Something went really wrong. I mean, can you imagine you're in the middle of a worship service, everything's going great, and all of a sudden, just some young man just dies. That's going to cause something to happen. Just dies. And they look at him, and they do, the, they do the autopsy report, and they realize there's nothing wrong with his heart. There's nothing wrong with his brain. He is perfectly healthy. There's no reason why he should have died. But he did. And that's exactly what happened. Something went wrong. But here's the thing. David was doing everything because he desired God's presence. And who in here doesn't want to have the presence and the power of God in their life? Who wouldn't, wouldn't want to have God's miracles and blessings to pour out or even just understand that in the trying times of life that God is here with you? That is amazing, right? That's a good thing to desire and to want. This was David's motivation, was to have this feeling, to have the presence of God with him at all times. The ironic thing is many times when we walk into church or walk out of church, we come in here and leave and listen to messages and we're all excited and hyped up about desiring the presence of God. And I mean, I'm pretty sure there's probably times when I've preached a sermon that left people thinking that desiring the presence of God was enough. And I've heard sermons that have just gotten you excited about desiring the presence of God and wanting what God has for you. But let's look at what David did and put it in today's culture just for a minute. First, like I said, David was a man of power. He was the most powerful man in the world or most powerful man in that land. And his army was feared. Okay, so let's just use President Trump. It's like he was in President Trump's office. He was the president of the United States in today's scenario. And he says, he calls down, he calls his secretary or whatever, and he says, hey, look, I want to do something. But I need you not to... Call me about anything. I don't care if there's a terrorist attack. I don't care if, if, if there's a nation that wants to destroy us. I don't care if somebody's complaining about a law. A law needs to be signed. It needs to be turned over. I don't care who calls, what it's about. I need you to, to not forward it to me. As a matter of fact, I'm shutting down the Oval Office for today because I want to go get the power and the presence of God and I'm going to bring it back. That's a pretty powerful and bold statement. And then he says, then he goes beyond that and he says, you know what, as a matter of fact, let's go a little bit further because I don't want to just do it myself. I want to bring the most powerful people in the land with me. So he calls up, he gets Congress together. He gets the, the judicial arm of, of the government together, which would be a, ma a miracle in and of itself that the Congress, the judicial department, and, and the executive office would all get together and do something as one accord. But he says, hey, we're going to all do this. That'd be a miracle, right? And and, and we're going to go and we're going to bring the presence of God back and we're going to celebrate him. Okay, that would be amazing. And we would all be on board with that and we would cheer that. And here's the thing. Then he says, you know what? But even let's go a little bit farther than that. We are going to buy a brand new limo. Because it says, says an ox, a brand new oxen cart. That doesn't make any sense to us. So we're going to buy a brand new limo. And we're not going to just buy any limo because I won't even put it, put it in in Air Force One, I won't put it in my presidential limo. I won't put it in Marine One. I'm going to put it in a brand new limo. It's going to be a top of the line limo. Let me tell you something. I looked up just out of curiosity. I did a little bit of research. I was like, what, what is, does a top of the line limo cost? There are limos that cost over $4 million for a car. 
One sultan has one, I think it was $10 million. It's covered in gold. I'm like, oh my gosh. There was another one. The most ostentatious one I saw was one that was made out of the body of an airplane. I'm like, how do you get that in a McDonald's drive-thru? But, and then he said, you know what? And here's the deal. The only thing that will ride in that limo will be the, pres- the power and the presence of God. This Ark of the Covenant. That's the only thing except for the driver. And the driver will be there and he will, he will not be allowed to eat in that limo. I don't want it to smell like stale chicken in that limo. It's going to have the new car smell all the time. And it's, it's going to be clean. It's going to be pristine. And, and, and it's going to, that's the only thing that will be in there is the thing that will carry the presence of God. And then he says, on top of that, we're going to get the best musicians in the land. We're going to get all the rock stars, hip-hop artists. We are going to get all the best of the best of the best, sir, in the land to do this. And they're going to celebrate, and they're going to worship God. That would be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? And then he says, you know what? On top of that, we are going to have a parade Yeah, and I'm not talking about any old parade. We're going to have a parade that makes the Macy's Day Parade look like it's a local thing. We are going to have one that everybody stops and talks about. It's broadcasted all over the world. People are putting it on their Facebook Live, and they're doing, they're making it their Instagram pictures. They're doing all this stuff. That's the thing. We're going to, we're going to do that, and we're going to do it, and we're going to celebrate the greatness of God. And that looks and sounds great, doesn't it? But there's one thing missing. One thing. David did not follow the protocols that God had established in the law of Moses. He leaned on his relationship with God and he thought that would carry him through. He said, hey, I'm I'm good with God. Nothing's going to happen. We're just going to do it my way because my way is better. And with this attitude, he dishonored God, and he showed a lack of humility. In Exodus 25, it talks about the design of the ark, and part of that design are poles. These poles are put in there, and they are not to be removed. And those poles were meant to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And then in Numbers 4, it shows that God established a precedent and an order for transportation. It says in verse 15 that when Aaron and his sons finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, as the camp sets out, after that, the sons of Koath which Koath, they were Levites. And these guys were so pure that God chose them to carry his presence. They had to go through a cleaning ritual, a cleansing ritual. And, and, and they had to do all these things, right? And they were like the holiest of the holy type of people. Not arrogant. They just were right with God. Matter of fact, I can't even think of anybody probably in history that like in our history or modern history, that compares. And they shall carry these things, but they shall not touch these holy things lest they die. This is after they've done all the cleansing rituals and everything. These are the things of the tent of meeting that the sons of Koath are to carry, and in that is listed the Ark of the Covenant. Think about this. God says even the most holy people cannot touch it. David disobeyed the protocols that God established. God doesn't want empty praise. He wants something else. He wanted obedience. And David learned this the hard way. He learned the hard way That passionate pursuit requires ongoing obedience. You're going to hear this a lot this month. 
This is the theme, like slogan for this month. Passionate pursuit requires ongoing obedience. In other words, if you're going to pursue God and you're going to run after him, you have to obey his commands. You have to do what he says. You have to honor him that way. When we desire to see a move of God in our lives, that's the start. But many times we stop there. And there's this verse in scripture that I've heard used time and time again um, about what, what we have to do in order to see God move and what we have to do in order for him to transform our lives, transform our nations and our cities and things like that. And it's in 2 Chronicles 7. God shows up. This is the, the surrounding story. God shows up to bless the temple that has been built by Solomon. This is a grand temple. It is beautiful. Solomon is the son of King David. The Ark of the Covenant is housed in this temple. And that's where they're going to do the sacrifices. And they've been doing sacrifices all day long. They've been praising God and worshiping God. They've been following the protocols and those things. And God shows up. Boom. And he says, one of the things that he says as part of the blessing of the temple is this. It's found in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, you guys know where I'm going with this? Yeah. Who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear, hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Did you guys catch that? The God said, this is what it's going to take for me to heal your land. And so many times we use this verse as a caveat to basically say, if we humble ourselves and we pray and we ask God, please God, show up, do something amazing, that that's what's going to cause God to heal our land. But God says this. This is what he says, and I'm going to put this in a little bit different wording so that we can kind of catch what he's really driving at. If you humble yourself in prayer, making me a priority, making me a priority, in such a way that you stop doing things that do not reflect who I am, or in other words, act in obedience, then I will hear and I will heal your land. We have to repent. We have to stop doing things that we're doing that are not God's way. It's kind of like this. What if somebody came to you, and it was like a week or two before your birthday, and they said, hey, I want to do something to honor you for, on your birthday. And they go, oh, okay. And they, you guys decide to have a party. Okay. And they say, well, what kind of cake do you like? Oh, I don't know. I like chocolate cake. Okay. Well, what kind of ice cream do you like? Oh, I like vanilla ice cream with hot fudge on it. Okay. And then they say, well, do you have any allergies? And you like list off some allergies and things like that. What kind of decorations do you like? And they ask you all the right questions. And then you show up at their house on the appointed day. After you've been excited, you're hopeful. You're like, man, it's going to be so cool. This is going to be so awesome. You know, they're going to have all my friends there. And you walk in, and yeah, your friends are there, but the house is dirty. The decorations are all about them. They're not anything that you would even enjoy or like. And then they go, and they bring the cake to you. And instead of it being, being a chocolate cake like you wanted, it is, it is a vanilla cake. And then they turn around and you said, well, I, they bring out the ice cream and you say, you look at the ice cream and you get confused because you say, I asked for vanilla ice cream with hot fudge on it and you bought Rocky Road and I'm allergic to peanuts. Are you going to feel honored? No, because it became about them. Guys, that's what we do in church a lot. We say, Jesus, God, we want you to show up. He says, okay, if you want me to show up, do these things. We say, okay, that sounds good, and then we do whatever we want. We make it about us. It's not honoring. We 
Because what we say is we say, God, show up and do something amazing. And we honor you with our lips, but we refuse to change. See, I'm not talking about styles of music or anything like that. I'm talking about we refuse to change our hearts. We refuse to change our actions. We refuse to obey. This tells God that we don't want him, but we we want what he can do for us. Do you hear that? This tells God we don't want him, but we want what he can do for us. I want the miracles, God, in my life. I want want the healings, but I don't really want you because I don't want to do the things that it's required to take and get your presence. This attitude has consequences. We're going to look at the consequence real quick of what happened in David's story. And we're going to look at this other character, Uzzah. And his response to the Ark of the Covenant falling. Uzzah, he was the son of Abinadad. And the thing we know about Abinadad is his home was where David was going to get the ark from. I don't know that we know a lot more about him, but we know that much. And Uzzah seems to be getting the raw end of this deal. I mean, think about it. He's taking part in this whole thing, and, and he's the one who dies. And then also, this part of the story makes God seem kind of mean. But before we make snap judgments... Let's really explore what's really happening. Let's look at this again. Uzzah is walking next to the the ark. The oxen stumble. He reaches out and he touches the ark, which represents the glory of God on the earth. And God gets angry with Uzzah and, and Uzzah dies. But why? The ark, as I've said, has had specific instructions given by God for how to transport it and carry it and handle it. So the whole company is in disobedience. Everybody is in disobedience. I can almost guarantee that Uzzah's dad told him, hey, don't touch the ark. Don't ever touch the ark, no matter what you do. I can guarantee that. Because if you knew the protocols of God, you told you had that ark living in your house, even whether you believed or not, you weren't chancing it, right? You know something's dangerous for your kids, you're gonna tell them not to do it, right? Well, this whole company is living in disobedience. This is a national sin. You guys ever heard that phrase before? A national sin? I guarantee things are popping in your mind right now that are national sins. They're participating in a national sin. So God is being dishonored. The next thing, the oxen, when the oxen stumble, Uzzah takes it upon himself to protect the ark. And he violated a couple things here. Not even the priests were supposed to touch this ark after they had been through the cleansing ritual, after they had kept themselves holy, after they had done all the things of God. They were not even supposed to touch the ark. He also undermined God, thinking that he had to save God. He had to save the ark, the representation of God on the earth, which showed a lack of faith. You know, one of the things about this part of the story Some people are like, well, it's reaction, whatever. No, no, no. He thought he had to protect God. Well, I would never act that way. Really? You've never acted in a way that you felt like you had to protect God? Let somebody post on Facebook or Instagram something negative about God or the church. See what happens. That's just a simple way. I do believe there are times that we need to defend our faith and we need to know what we believe and why. And I think apologetics is is important. I do not think that most of the time it's on Facebook. I also don't think that we need to go at it from an attitude that we are defending God. How ridiculous is that, really? God, the creator of the universe who survived a lot longer than I've been alive, needs my protection? That elevates us up to God's level. I don't need to defend him. I just need to move out of the way and let the lion go at it. The 
Sometimes the best way to show the evidence of God is to be silent. Okay, I'm sorry you think that way. I've told that to people. Man, I'm sorry you believe that. But he thought that he could save the ark, which showed, showed a lack of faith. And if you notice, there's another detail in this story that a lot of times we kind of skim over. It says, in some versions of the Bible, it says it this way, and I really like the way that it says it. It says that the oxen stumbled. It doesn't say anything about the cart rocked. It doesn't even say, it doesn't say that the, the Ark of the Covenant looked like it was going to hit the ground and smash to pieces. It says the oxen stumbled. And he touched it. So he reacted out of fear. So in this case with Uzzah, we have just right there in that quick little snippet of the story, not only did he take part in a national disobedience or a national sin, but he also walked out, he walked in a lack of faith and he reacted in fear. That changes the story a little bit, doesn't it? It wasn't just like, oh, I'm gonna protect the ark. No, 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 I don't want damage to come to the ark. No, he reacted in fear. He wasn't walking in faith and he was participating in national disobedience. The question that the Israelites needed to ask, and I think the question that God wants us to ask today is who is like our God? Who is like our God? I think that's why this part of the story is in there. I think that's why a lot of this happened is because they weren't asking that question. The purpose of this story is to remind us and David and the nation of Israel what they need to be reminded of is who is our God? Who is your God? A few years ago, there were some t-shirts that came out. And at first, I thought they were kind of funny. Then I kind of thought about it. I was like... Yeah, that's probably not good. I thought it was kind of a cool concept because I do believe that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I believe that Jesus wants to be the closest person in, in your life. I believe that he wants to be that, that person that you go to, that being that you go to when you, when you need, have needs and those kind of things. The Bible says that he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. But a few years ago, there was a t-shirt that came out and it said, Jesus is my homeboy. Anybody remember that? It was sold in the malls. It was sold online. It was all over the place. Jesus is my homeboy. And that sounds all well and good at first because you're like, oh yeah, well, you know, you trust in Jesus. No, there's a problem with that thinking. Yes, he is that friend. But he is also a fearsome God who demands righteousness. We are called to walk in the fear of who God is. In the Hebrew language, there's two major definitions for fear. Different words, but they both mean fear in our language. But the definitions and the way that you have to break them down in our language to understand them is one of them means fear of the unknown, fear of what could happen, fear of like, you know, the thing that's hiding under your bed when you're a child or the, whatever is to come around the next corner or fear of what could happen in your life, fear of death, fear, that kind of fear, the kind of fear that people experience when they go and see, see a horror movie, fear. The other fear is the fear that is described in such a way that it's, you realize that you are standing in a holy moment, in a holy place with a holy God. And that's the fear of God. Understanding who you are in position to him. The only time the Bible talks about fear in a good way is when it's talking about fearing God. That's it. Fearing God. Understanding that you're standing in a holy moment and in a holy place with a holy God. 
You know, I've mentioned that the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament was the physical representation of the power and the presence of God on the earth. We don't know where it is. There's some theories out there, but we don't know where it is for sure. But do you know that there is a physical representation of the power and the presence of God in the earth that is known and revealed? Do you know what it is? It's the church. It's believers, people who believe in Jesus Christ. That should change the perspective on who you are. You are the physical representation of the power and the presence of God. You have authority, you have power. So what does all this mean? What does all this mean for us? Why are we talking about it? I believe that God wants us to really grab onto four things today. Four things that I think if we grab onto them will change our lives, will change the way we approach church, will change the way we approach everything. The first one is we must obey God in all things. What do I mean by that? What what is that? That means we obey God's commands even when it doesn't make sense in our society, in our world, in our thinking. We obey God's commands no matter what. This book is full of God's commands. Do this, don't do that. Love this way. You know, act this way. Love your neighbor. There's commands about how to treat your enemies. There's commands in here about how to treat your wife, how to treat your your husbands, how to treat your children. There's commands in here about how to handle every single major thing in our lives. Now, there are some areas where it doesn't touch. Like, for example, it doesn't say how much time you should spend on the internet, okay? But it does say, hey, you shouldn't look at this kind of content You shouldn't expose yourself to these kind of things. It doesn't say how many hours a week you should watch football, but it might say, hey, what halftime shows you should watch. Okay, bad joke, too soon. (laughs) It does not say in here how much time you should spend watching TV, but it will tell you the content of the shows. And you can gauge whether or not you should watch that show based off of what's found in this book. It doesn't say what you should do for a job, but it will tell you how to conduct yourself there. There are commands all throughout this book. And we need to obey God in all things. Not just the things we find convenient. There are commands in here about not having sex outside of marriage. He said the S word. There are commands in here about how to live your life. How to treat your children. We're commanded to love our neighbors. Go on and on. But we got to obey all the commands. We can't just take the ones. There are commands in there I don't like and I don't understand. The things that I would, if I was God, I would write them differently. But guess what? He didn't ask for my opinion. He didn't ask for any of our opinions, did he? He said, this is what it takes to love and run after me. Do you want to love and run after me for real? Because if you do, you have to do these things. Pick up your cross daily and follow me is what he says. Die to your desires. Die to your designs. Die to those things. The second thing we have to do is we cannot add or take away from his commands. We can't can't take away anything out of this Bible, and we can't add to them. Guys, listen. There are cultural things that we do in our churches and we do in America that we, we say we almost put on the level of the commands of God. And that's a sin. The Bible says, don't add anything. It says in the book of Revelation, talking about the book of Revelation, but there's another section of scripture that talks about this too as a whole Bible, but the most famous one is in Revelation. And it says, do not add anything or take away anything from this book of prophecy. Because if you add something, I will add to your punishment. If you take away, I will take away your blessings. 
I don't know about you, but I don't want to take the, I don't want God to add the punishments to me, and I don't want him to take away his blessings. Listen, guys, an example of a cultural thing that we believe, that we talk about, and we almost preach on the level of God's word as something that you have to do in order to be a good Christian and a good follower of Christ is, for example, saying Merry Christmas. I'm going to tell you something. The Bible does, that's a hill that people die on. I, I say Merry Christmas. Why? Because I know that in our culture it acknowledges who I follow. But the reality is if somebody comes up to you and says happy holidays and you give them a sneer and a look and you're like, you should say Merry Christmas to me, guess what? You're actually walking in disobedience of God because you're not loving them the way you should. Oh, snap. I just stepped on some religious toes. Merry Christmas is not a salvation issue. Why do we keep elevating those kind of things to the commands of God? There were years where we got wrapped up in that so much that we kind of forgot about the unborn. Again, I'm not saying it's bad to say Merry Christmas. But I think it's about where we elevate it and where we put it. We cannot add or take away from his commands. The next thing, we need to trust God even even if it looks like he's going to fail. Even when it looks like it's going to fail and that he is not going to come through, we need to trust God. I had a friend of mine that I was talking to the other day. He's going through a really, really rough time in his family. And he's had people come to him and say, well, you know, brother, if you just had enough faith, if you just had enough faith, God would fix it. I'm going to tell you something. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. I'm serious. That is not of God. As a matter of fact, I think, and I told him this, I think and I believe that it takes more faith to say that God is good and worship him when it doesn't seem like he's going to fix it. And maybe he doesn't fix it. But if you still acknowledge him as good, that takes more faith. So if anybody comes to you and says, well, if you just had more faith, God would fix it. You look at them and you say, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. That is not of God. If you've ever said that to somebody, I would challenge you to repent. Because we have to trust him even when it looks like he's going to fail us. The fourth thing is excitement is not engagement. You can come to church and you can get all hyped and excited just like David had the parade and all this stuff going on. You can get all excited about God. We can play the right songs. The worship team could excel and and we could have all this wonderful thing. And and Tony, myself, or, or Pastor Dan, or somebody get up here and speak the right message that tugs at your heart and you're all excited and you're pumped and you're jazzed. You're like, yeah, let's go. Let's go. Let's do this. You know, That's not engagement. Engagement is obedience. It's when we are obeying God that we are truly engaged in what he is doing and engaged in advancing the kingdom of God. Just because we get excited doesn't mean we're doing anything. People get excited at football games all the time, don't they? They get excited at football games all the time, but guess what? They're not the players on the field. It's time to get out of the stands and to start playing, guys. And the only way we can play is if we obey. Because passionate pursuit requires ongoing obedience. So I know the whole worship team's not here, and Claudia's going to play. And she can start playing now. But what I want to do is I just want to take a couple of minutes. And I want us to seek God. And I want, I want you, you to ask him, where is it in your life that he's challenging you to obey and you are resisting him? And repent of that. So she's going to play. 
And then after a few minutes, I'll come back up here and I'll pray us out. But I really want to challenge you guys to take this time and ask him where he's calling for obedience in your life. Father, we want to get to the place.